Doug Lip. Day after day, and it's like they're coming in droves asking you the most ridiculous questions, and the park has 50,000 people in it, and it's hot, and it's muggy, and it's really, really nasty outside. The last thing I want to do is tell somebody where Fantasyland is for the 10th time in the last 10 seconds. So I went to my boss, and I said, I'm going nuts around here, and he says, it's your attitude, pal. And after I blew a gasket, he said, no, you got to think about this. Numbers one and two, be other-centered and put yourself in their shoes. How many of these customers, how many of these guests have come from foreign countries or from other states that have fewer stoplights in the whole country than we have in a five-mile radius of this park? He said, I, I want you to think about the transaction is they give us money and we give them a ticket. I said, okay, I'm with you. And he said, but before we let them in the park, we ask them to open up their head and take out the broom and put it in a locker. Does that make it easier for you? He says, think about this poor mom and dad that are coming in. They don't know what's going on. Their kids have been ballistic for the past 15 hours on the drive. Their conditioning broke down. And you expect them to know where Tomorrowland is? And their kids are dragging them all over the place? No, they're not going to know that. So I said, OK, fine, I'll try to do that. So I go back out, and I'm sweeping. I've got my long handle bucket in one hand, my long handle broom in the other. I'm sweeping. And I'm thinking, OK, the poor people have come from all over the country, all over the land. And before 15, 20 seconds goes by, I'm thinking, people are pigs, people are pigs, people are pigs. <laughs> because there's garbage everywhere. <laughs> there isn't garbage in the garbage receptacle. No, it's all around it. There's garbage in the trees. And if you go in the restroom, that's another story entirely. I was convinced that people were out in the, in the parking lot in groups of like 15 or 20 saying, OK, you guys have the first shift. You're going to go to Tomorrowland. You're going to trash it. Ready? Go. OK, you guys, <laughs> you're going to go to the parts of the Caribbean, and you're going to get sick on the boat. Ready? Go. <laughs> and we sweepers had to clean all that stuff up and be smiling and nice to all the people that ask this ridiculous question. Doug Lift, the art of exceptional customer service and leadership. Service and leadership are the same thing. Great organizations that have great service in a consistent manner are always manned by people, populated by people that are good leaders, whether it's leaders of other people or they just have a good attitude about their own jobs. Art versus science. The art of customer service is the interpersonal side. It's that feeling that's, that somebody gets when they walk in the store. It's how long they have to wait before they're helped. And according to the data that David shared, the dress bar and organization, the perception is, I don't have to wait when I walk in here. Whereas in some places, it's like, hello, can I spend some money here? Right? So the art of customer service versus the science, and the science is the tangible, technical stuff. Doug Lip, the art of exceptional customer service and leadership. I was working with some heart surgeons about three years ago. They were part of a clinic that belonged to an HMO. They were all part of this whole package. They were losing business, and the reason was this. They had rotten service. They maintained their skill sets as surgeons. They could split a chest, they could fix the valves, but they were nasty to the patients or to the patient's families. We're the best, don't talk to anybody else. If you don't like it, tough. Well, the competition came along, and competition always decides how high the bar is going to be. And the competition had equally qualified, skilled surgeons who had good bedside manner. And they had staff members and front office people that could help these patients or the patient's families wind their way through the maze of insurance claims or whatever the case might be. So again, it's both have to be in place. Doug Lip, the art of exceptional customer service and leadership. Doug's long career at both Disneyland and Walt Disney Studios provides countless insights that he shares with audiences all over the world. Doug was fast-tracked into management after extensive training in all aspects of theme park operations. During his years at Disney, Doug found that even strong organizations like Disney must embrace change and be willing to innovate. So at the park level, we had this arrogance, and at the headquarters, we had another kind of arrogance. It was, we know how to create family entertainment, so don't you, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, even try to tell us what you need. The voice of the customer doesn't exist. We tell you what you need. So as a result, we had some very trying times. Let me take a poll here. How many of you in your lives have ever seen, whether it's in the theaters or in video form, Star Wars? Raise your hands, please. Most everybody in the room. How about Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, some of those flicks? Great, most everybody in the room. Unfortunately, those were not Disney movies. About the same time those movies were in their heyday, we produced such blockbusters as, and I'm going to find out who the real losers are in this room. <laughs> Anybody ever see The Black Hole? <laughs> all right, now this is the other test. Did you also see Tron? 
Yes, so I, thank you for your service. So I, you, you provided me gainful employment many years ago. I don't know what it is, but usually the same people that saw Black Hole saw Tron. Now, you notice the lack of hands that went up? Well, that's just a small indication of what happened throughout the country, is those were box office bombs. Didn't matter. We had our recipe. We had our procedures. We weren't going to go any, any great length to change those because we're Disney. So then we had this other person come along, and I think we reached the pinnacle of our arrogance when this producer came along with an idea for a film, and we kept making this person jump through all these hoops. This is our policy. This is our procedure. We don't care about your voice. I'm only listening to my voice. We're going to change your script. We're going to take your name off of it because that's the Disney way. And after about six months of going back and forth, Steven Spielberg got fed up with our approach, went to Universal Studios and created E.T., the extraterrestrial, mildly successful flick. <laughs> Anybody ever see that one? Yeah, okay. And again, our answer was the smash hit, Baby. You didn't see that, did you? Good. <laughs> so what we said was, well, let's not create any new stuff. We'll just keep recreating the old things. Anybody ever see Herbie the Love Bug? Come on, come on. Okay. I know you saw it. <laughs> now, nothing wrong with Herbie, but when it's Herbie the Love Bug goes to Monte Carlo, Herbie the Love Bug goes bananas, Herbie the Love Bug volume 65, and you got Dean Jones and Suzanne Plachette kind of chasing Herbie saying, Herbie, wait, Herbie, Herbie getting kind of long in the tooth, right? We weren't willing to break the mold to take a risk because no one was truly empowered. I remember sitting in meetings where people would sit around saying, what would Walt do? What would Walt say? What would Walt think? And nobody ever said, Walt's not with us anymore. <laughs> the family unit of the 1950s and the 60s has changed. Wake up. But no, no, no. The mantra, Walt, what would Walt think, almost killed us. When you have a name like Marriott, when you have a name like Disney, there is tremendous history that you should be proud of, but don't hang out there. Use that as a foundation or as a substrate upon which to build your current and future business. Doug Lip, the art of exceptional customer service and leadership. As head of training at the world-renowned Disney University, Doug taught the importance of consistency and service in the popular traditions orientation. Consistency is probably one of the things that set Disney apart from other organizations is everybody had to be on stage looking right. Your environment and your clothing, everything had to be just right. Not that the standards are fine for every other organization, but something as simple as grooming. Back in the 70s when guys had long hair, we had standards that were really unusual. It was more like the military. Guys could not have mutton chops below their earlobes. Your hair couldn't touch your ears and it couldn't touch your collar. Women could not wear earrings larger than a quarter of an inch in diameter, could not have eyeliner on, had to have makeup that was natural tone to your skin. It went on and on and on and on and on. But the thing was, when they would come to a new higher orientation, nobody got to slip by. All business is show business. Regardless of the technical aspects of your job, whether it's high-speed internet access, there's always the smile the friendly tone of voice, the eye contact, huge. On stage versus off stage. We at Disney were absolute nuts about this. Do you know where, when you are in earshot or eye shot of a guest? When you go to your break room, you can go ahead and take your wig off, you can have your cigarette, but when you are in earshot or eye shot of the guest, be prepared. If you're driving a Disney vehicle in the middle of Utah and it's got a logo on the side of the truck, you're on stage, so keep your finger out of your nose. You're on stage. You don't know who's looking at you. On stage versus off stage persona is, is absolutely one of the most important things. It's amazing how many of us come into contact with people supposedly serving us who are complaining about the boss or complaining about their veterinarian or whatever the case might be in an on stage environment. We were focused on safety, courtesy, show, capacity. That was our priority. Safety number one for guests and cast members. Safety, courtesy, do you smile and guide somebody somewhere? Safety, courtesy, show, how does your costume look? And if you tell the cast members, if you tell the associates you're gonna give them a costume or a uniform in your vernacular, then give it to them. Don't keep a desk clerk waiting for two weeks because you don't have the right size. That sends a tremendous message that it really doesn't matter, even though we talked about it meaning a whole lot. So backing up what you say with what your actions are. One more example and I'm gonna move on. We talked about for our cast members to maintain the cleanliness of the park was the, the utmost challenge because that's what our guests wanted. 
When you're walking to or from a break, pick up trash. So by the end of eight hours of training, I would then take all the cast members into the park for what we called an on-stage tour, literally walking through the park during business hours when you've got 50 or 60,000 people in the park. I would take them into Main Street, and I'd always find a piece of trash, and I'd stop about 20 feet from it, turn my back to it, pretend I didn't see it, and then I would be talking about the theming on Main Street and how the buildings are designed to look taller than they are. The second and third stories are progressively smaller. The paint is done so that you get a feeling of depth where there is no depth. It's basically a movie set. And how in the candy kitchen there's this giant bowl of vanilla extract. And they blow this fan of air over it and it infuses into Main Street so people's gastric juices start flowing. Talk about guerrilla marketing you're going to hear about later on from Jay. This was amazing. But what I found was that while I was talking about that, none of my new cast members are listening. They're all zeroed in on that piece of trash and wondering how long until it gets picked up and by whom. Generally speaking, it was picked up within seconds, and nine times out of ten it was picked up by someone other than custodial. Picked up by somebody wearing a tie or carrying a walkie-talkie or in a costume. Doug Lip, the art of exceptional customer service and leadership. Exceptional service is everyone's responsibility. My job at Disneyland as the head of training was to get people into the university, newly hired employees, fresh out of high school, fresh out of college, transferred in from other engineering groups, whatever the case might be, and I got them at least for eight hours. And my job was to sprinkle pixie dust on people and get them all excited. And then I'd send them off for their on-the-job training. Because we realized that if you're going to produce out on the job, we don't want trainees evacuating a ride. We want people who know what they're doing evacuating a ride if there's an issue. But it's amazing how often I would get executives calling me saying, hey, you know, we just hired this new marketing director and she is the best thing since sliced bread. Do me a favor and, and cut her out of training for the next few weeks and when things calm down, I'll send her back to you. But we've got this really important project to get out of the way. What do you say? And I'd say, nope, can't do it. Then he would call my boss and complain. And bless my boss's soul, every time somebody would call, call and complain, my boss would say, what did Doug say to you? There was consistency there of a policy, of a procedure, of an application. Yes, it was a sacred cow, but it was in place for a good reason, and it was communicated regularly. Whereas if my boss had countermanded me, all of a sudden my credibility is gone, and all of a sudden we have inconsistency. Doug Lip, a member of the startup team for highly successful Tokyo Disneyland, fluent in Japanese, providing consulting services in the United States, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and Africa an expert on global customer service, management, and competitiveness. Doug is the author of numerous articles and books on leadership, customer service, and international business, including Even Monkeys Fall From Trees, The Balance of Art and Science for Outstanding Customer Service, and his most recent, The Changing Face of Today's Customer, How to Attract and Retain a Diverse Customer and Employee Base. Doug has spent over 30 years working from the front lines to the boardrooms of corporations around the world and has been a featured guest on many broadcasts, including National Public Radio and Bloomberg News. In many of his presentations, Doug addresses a key opportunity for many businesses today. The globe is shrinking. Is your business expanding? What does it look like to be an international organization? I think that within the firm you have incredible opportunities and incredible challenges. And just by having an international presence, or just by having international members on your team, that does not guarantee success. On the surface it might look great, but what it boils down to is how are you dealing with the change, and are you changing along with it? And then share with you six of the most commonly occurring challenges in multinational, multicultural teams so that you can recognize what those are, and I'm sure you're already dealing with many of these things, so that you can team up to truly tackle the tough issues. One of the toughest issues for international teams is effective communication. You might think you're speaking the same language, but are you really? There was one story in particular before we opened up Tokyo Disneyland where we were getting about five days out from the grand opening, so we were having a series of soft openings. You would invite the media, VIPs, let them go through the park, and then you would test your ability to do the job. And I'll never forget the night before our first soft opening, one of the senior American executives flew over from Burbank, California, where our headquarters is located, and was going to every division of the park and giving pep talks. The first pep talk that he gave was to the custodial crew. 
These are the people that clean the park. And he said, I want you to go out tonight and make this park shine. Be proud of your product. Make it shine. About 4 o'clock in the morning, I got a panic phone call from that same American executive, and he was just going crazy saying, you're not going to believe what the guys did in Custodio. I said, what? They cleaned the haunted mansion. <laughs> I said, what's your problem? You told them to make the park shine. He said, yeah, but they took down the cobwebs. They cleaned off all the rust stains. They didn't clean it correctly. And I said, well, you never told them what clean meant. What does clean mean in your culture? What does clean mean in my culture? Success in the global economy requires a new kind of flexibility, cultural flexibility that Doug calls style switching. And one of the key ways to fill in the gap is to be willing to do something that's called style switching. It doesn't mean that you give up your morals. It doesn't mean that you give up your values. But it might mean that you change the way that you run a meeting. It might mean that you change the way that you conduct a performance review with someone on your team. It might mean that you change the way that you interact with your clients, whether it be the time of day or how often. So by style switching, you unlock the opportunities to create those seamless connections with your clientele. It's not always so easy, though. Style switching on the surface sounds, oh, no problem. But when something runs against what you've been doing for years, that's when you have to do a gut check and you have to think, am I really ready for international business? Am I really ready to manage a multicultural team? Global competitiveness, style switching, cultural flexibility, effective communication, putting it all together to create more opportunities for growth and success global service in a local market, the changing face of America. And it's amazing to me organizations that are just local mom and pop organizations as well as multinationals are expanding the demographic pie by taking into account the number of immigrants that have moved into this country. Let me give you an example of being flexible and looking beyond the obvious. We've all heard of Starbucks, fantastic organization domestically and internationally. One of the reasons why they're so successful is they're flexible. They had on Friday evenings a group of deaf customers, hard of hearing, deaf customers coming in, 30 to 40 people on a weekly basis. Well, Kelly asked one of her staff members to go interview these folks. He basically did a needs assessment interview with these folks and they said, we love your product. Your lattes are lovely, your grandes and ventis are great, but ordering is a pain in the neck. We walk up to a register and your signs are 20 feet behind you, high on a wall. So unless I do my best Marcel Marceau routine, I can't order very quickly. For about $1.20 per register, you've got three registers, we encourage you to take a small version of your menu, laminate it in plastic, and then attach to that menu an erasable pen. Problem solved. Now I can walk up and circle that. Now we also know another sacred cow of Starbucks is to write the order and the name of the customer in black grease pen on the cup hand that to the filler. Well, by the time Cynthia realizes her name has been called, she's a little bit sheepish. She doesn't want to come up. Hearing able customers are looking around saying, where's Cynthia already? Kind of undoes the atmosphere. Back to the drawing board. They simply changed the color of the ink for hard of hearing customers. In one month, that population of hard of hearing customers went to 400 people. Doug Lip customized presentations. Extensive prevent research with management, customers, and frontline employees providing a lasting experience. Doug Lips insightful, humorous examples, teaching, training, inspiring audiences. Doug Lip, the art of exceptional customer service and leadership. Teamwork is essential. The whole idea about walk a mile in someone's shoes, put yourself in somebody else's shoes, I am a firm believer in it. I was so pleased to hear about this when I was originally talking with Eric and Barbara about the program that you put into place where you do actually have people going from the field to headquarters and vice versa. In fact, I was talking to one interviewee who said that one of the DSMs came to headquarters and worked in payroll for a while and actually saw some of the mistakes that were made in the field which caused payroll problems, which everybody in the field groans and moans about anyhow. So there's nothing more powerful than seeing what somebody else is doing. And every organization is the same. Some groups feel like they're overworked and underpaid. Other groups always have the reputation of, gosh, they get paid to do that job, I could do that with my eyes shut, not a problem. And you develop these interdepartmental wars and battles and turf issues that absolutely undermine ability to get the job done. 
And the one group that always got the bad rap for having a cush job and everybody thought that they were overpaid and underworked were the costumed characters. And so I'd like to share with you a story about what we went through to make sure that everybody in the organization knew how tough it was to be a costumed character, how tough it was to be a ride operator and get people through the lines quickly, how tough it was to be an engineer and create great rides, how tough it was to be a maintenance technician and maintain the stuff that everybody trashed. So we had a rotation program. And I'll never forget the very first day that I went through it to test it out, I got to be in the character department, Tigger, for the day. Remember, if you fall, hold on to your head so it doesn't go rolling down Main Street. <laughs> And be prepared, because moms and dads are going to want a picture of their kid with only you, so they're going to be drop-kicking other kids out of the way, saying, okay, I want your picture, get out of the way. And other thrill-seekers are going to do some really weird things, because they want a picture doing something crude and rude with a character in Disneyland. So anything you can imagine has happened. So make a long story short, we all go traipsing out onto stage, and within seconds, it was just like she said, it was like bees attacking a, a sandwich at a picnic or monkeys crawling out of the trees. They were all over us, and I had kids hanging on my tail. I'm trying to, trying to get them off of my tail, and they're jumping, and parents pulling me the other way. I was so afraid I was going to fall, I finally just sat down, and I was just letting the kids crawl all over me. And I watched all the other characters doing their thing, and I saw Captain Hook. He was over in the corner, just kind of leaning up against the wall, and the kids were just swarming around him. I couldn't see. I think the head turned sideways, and I was looking through his ear. So after that, we all had a much healthier respect for what all these costume characters go through. And then methodically, we went back to every other department to find out what it was like to be an engineer, um, an accountant, whomever. And after that two-week process of just kind of shadowing other people, it was amazing the turnaround in attitude and service to customer. Internal, which ultimately turns into external customer service. Thank you so much for your time today. For more information about Doug Lip, the art of exceptional customer service and leadership, contact the provider of this video.